Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Troy Rowan, and um, we have had kind of a long history with Troy given his age. <laughs> um, but the first time I met Troy, he was a uh, graduate student at the University of Missouri, and geez, Troy, you were maybe like in your first year, maybe? And you stood up, it was kind of a small advisory group, but you stood up and you gave a presentation about um, imputation and some of your research that you were working on. And you just immediately struck me as somebody who could, similar to Dr. Van Heusen, could talk the science, but could also translate to the general public and, and to producers as well. And so um, we have certainly followed Troy during his um, relatively short career so far. Um, Troy has been a um, multi-degree uh, recipient when he's a graduate student at the University of Missouri and he was on to the Boston Institute where young adults was his own. Um, and, and then now we're kind of seeing the next progression. Um, Dr. Rowan is at the University of and it has been recently funded with the voluntary grant as a faculty member, not a graduate student. And we work a lot with um, Troy and appreciate the collaboration there. So we will hear from Dr. Troy Rowan today in tech of your talk and laying the groundwork for the next generation of phenotyping, genotyping, and genomic information. So Troy, are you an employee or are you going to all right. Um, so I, I really appreciate Jackie um, and the ASA group we invited me over. And, and I just want to start off before I dive into this um, in this sort of talk, really just an appreciation for the, the amount of support that you all gave to your academic partners um, and, and really how science forward the American Civil Policy Association is, right? Um, I think that it's, it's not typical for a free association to, um, to be so so progressive and on the cutting edge of things and be making investments in, in technologies and ideas that they aren't ready for a time right away, um, but with your, your eye consistently on the future, whether that's in a, a large multi-free genetic evaluation, whether that's investing in grad students, um, whether that's investing and these sort of high impact projects, um, one of which I'll, I'll talk about here. But I, I just really want to commend you all as an association for being so science forward. I was looking through my book, and one of your very first sort of core missions, right, is science. And I think that as a, as a free association with our eye on, on improving um, the genetic basis of our population, right, um, those partnerships between uh, whether they're industry folks or, or folks at academic institutions, um, it, it makes everything stronger. And, and the, the support you guys give, not just, uh, I guess, financially, but also um, your openness to sharing data and let us, let us try out some, some uh, out there stuff on it. Um, I really hope that at the end of the day we'll, um, we'll sort of see the payoffs of those things. So, with that, I'll, I'll actually get around to talking uh, about what, what Jackie asked me to talk about. But I need to make a couple of disclaimers first. Um, disclaimer number one is that I'm not an actual animal breeder. Um, I play one on TV pretty frequently, but I'm very much a, um, an animal genomicist who I can, I can talk to animal breeders, um, I can talk to them like other geneticists, like my, um, the other geneticist at the um, University of Tennessee, Dr. John Beaver. Um, but I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle, and, and I really I, I want to underline, I just told Frank this when we were talking a second ago, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a bunch of things, a bunch of uh, sort of big picture ideas about where we might be going using the new types of data that are coming down the pipe. But uh, the implementation of these things is, is not immediately driven up, right? Um, some of these things are, are going to take some refinement and a whole lot of effort. So um, my job is in my research program is to, to throw out some of these, these wild and wacky ideas and occasionally come on catches and think we're, we're in business, right? So again, that partnership between um, folks who are running these genetic evaluations and, and us doing some more of that, that out there research. The other disclaimer I'll make is that I'm also uh, a city extension specialist at the University of Tennessee. And what I'm going to talk about today is sort of some cutting edge stuff, very future forward looking. But at the end of the day, when I'm out talking to the producers and, and one of my, my colleagues at the University of Tennessee, and I, Charlie Martinez, 
is actually a search call breeder. We've done a lot of, of surveys in trying to understand how our, our commercial producers utilize genetic tools, and, and it makes me pull my hair out sometimes, right? So with all of this stuff, right, we're being very forward looking on the most cutting edge stuff, but we gotta do the basics right first. And, and a lot of that is institution education, um, continuing to, to have partnerships with your commercial customers, helping them understand the technologies that they have access to. Um, and also as a right, we gotta keep reporting accurate feedback. You know, if I can come up with the craziest, uh, most cutting edge genome prediction model, but at the end of the day, if we're not reporting phenotypes on um, all of these traits, especially the ones that are hard to collect, um, that's really what fuels each kind of evaluation. So I guess my, my takeaway here, and the, the reason that I make the disclaimer, is that even though we, we have all these things that um, are out on the horizon and that are really exciting, we still gotta come back and, and do the basics right, um, because that's really the, the foundation in which all of this stuff rests on. But with that, I, Jackie gave me a whole lot of, of leeway in this presentation and said, talk about sequencing and imputation. Those are two things that um, my lab is, is still working on. Um, but also just projecting in the future what technology will come down. This is my favorite sort of off the field because I can, I can really um, think about in a dream scenario, right? 10 years from now, what are we going to be looking at? And I, I think with some of the developments that are coming down the, the pipe right now, there's a lot of exciting stuff that is, is going to cause a lot of change in our industry. But at the end of the day, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that stays the same, right? And you know, we'll be able to lay that out from both the genotyping standpoint, um, so some of the, the new and improved ways that we can do genotyping. How do we utilize that in a prediction context? And, and also, how do we how do we understand um, phenotypes and measure phenotypes in the new and novel ways we can use these new technologies? So this is, is just sort of my forward-looking fortune telling about what we might be doing in the, the coming years in, in the context of genetic evaluation. But the, the thing that doesn't change about any of this is that our, our singular goal is, if we've got to, and Allison talked about this, and she, she did a lot of good setup for me, because I too um, am an animal, animal geneticist, and I too, um, on this next slide, have breeders' equations, but what our focus needs to be on, right, is having a, a set of breeding goals, right? Whether you're the biggest deep top producer or you're a, a 20 head commercial operation in, in Southwest Virginia or East Tennessee, right? Our, our goal needs to be on steady genetic improvement. And all the things we talked about today, I'm going to try and bring back to this idea that this is helping us do a better job of, of making genetic progress in our population, leaving uh, this next generation better than the previous one, right? So, so simply focus on that Delta G, and, and my friend Jay Lush. And Jay Lush is actually the guy that comes up with the previous equation from um, the neighboring county in Iowa. Um, so there's something in the groundwater in southwest Iowa, I think, um, that is going to happen. But, but Dr. Lush comes up with this really elegant way of explaining, right, how do we make genetic progress over time? And, and Allison did a great job of introducing this for me. Um, but the one, or I guess two that I'll focus on, and these are the ones that she mentioned, is, is this idea of the accuracy of selection. So if an animal's true genetic merit, if we do an animal's true genetic merit, um, you wouldn't need uh, the American Cinephile Association to run a genetic evaluation. You wouldn't need Troy um, to, to do any research in this, right? If we knew the ground truth of an animal's actual genetic merit, uh, we don't have to do any of this prediction stuff, right? We would just, we just roll with that and, and we'd have a super fast on that. But, uh, the reality is that we have to we have to estimate this, right? And historically, um, you know, ten thousand years ago, we were like, oh, this cow it isn't attacking me right now. I'm going to select that cow, right? So um, that's a that's our, our first level of phenotypic selection. Then we figure out how to weigh animals, right? We want bigger animals, so we can weigh them. Our phenotypes become more accurate, and that correlation between our selection criteria and the animal's actual genetic merit um, gets a little bit higher, right? And whenever stuff up here on top gets higher, that means that we're making more genetic progress. EPDs come along in the in 1970s, right? We have a way of focusing our selection decision on our, our estimate of that animal's genetic merit. Genomics come along in the late 2000s, and even, even more, we can continue uh, to get closer to that animal's true genetic merit um, when it comes to, to that prediction. And so as we, we continue to make improvements to our genomic prediction, <coughs> 
that's really where we're focusing, right? How are we able to continue to close that gap between an animal's true genetic merit and in the prediction that we're using uh, to select those animals? And then generation interval, of course, if we can speed this up, um, whether that's through the, uh, the introduction of, of, uh, um, of younger animals, right? Identifying with higher confidence, animals earlier on in their lives are going to go on being um, influential, influential sires and breed, uh, that generation interval piece is really important. And so how do we continue to increase delta gene? Right? This is what the, the two pieces I'm going to focus on today is, is first, how do we improve our genomic predictions, right? We have this really well-established machinery. Um, it stayed, you know, uh, aside from the, the addition of genomics, it stayed virtually the same um, since the 19, you know, 1960s, 1970s. It built on accurate phenotypes, contemporary groups, and in really large numbers of individuals, we can increase the accuracy of genomics. And hopefully I'll, I'll be able to convince you guys that using some more advanced um, genomics and understanding of biology, we can continue to improve the accuracy of genomic predictions. And then the, the other one that I'll circle back to at the end, if I've got time here, is, is how we can maybe measure better phenotypes. And I know that this is a challenge across trades, right? How do we measure the actual economic trait? Um, how do we make the indicator that we're measuring uh, more closely related to that trait that we're really, really going to the genetic progress on? Um, and I think that there's some developments in, in precision livestock technologies that are going to allow us to, to leverage those more accurately. And so this is this is the goal, right, of, of all of this, and, and this is what EPDs are built on, right? We've got these big pedigrees. What we want to know is did this animal get the uh, get the better end of the stick, or did he get the short end of the stick when it comes to the genetic merit from his parents, right? We know that these siblings, they get 50% of DNA from the dad, 50% from the mom, right? Um, who's got a sibling in the audience? Anybody? I do. Who's the better looking in the sibling? Yeah, me too. Um, and, and so, so really, that's what we, we built all of this on, right? This trying to identify, um, and you've seen it, I'm sure, you know, we tested a, a set of flush banks, right? There could be a fair bit of variation in the EVs that, are, that those animals have, right? And so this was something that we could do with pedigree, but it was going to take us um, generations and multiple calf crops in order to, to disentangle if this bull was better than his, his other two full brothers. Whereas with genomics, we're able to accelerate that a little bit, right? Earlier on in their life, we can use the actual ground truth of, of that, uh, of, of the actual DNA that this animal inherits compared to this animal, and, and we can use that to make a more accurate uh, estimate of this animal there earlier on in life without having to go through all of that process. And the other big takeaway, right, is that genomics works, and, and I shouldn't have to convince anybody here of this, right? Um, this, this one, my favorite <coughs> is, this is from uh, the American Holstein population. This paper is published back in 2016, showing the change in generation interval um, when, when Holstein adopts genomic selection in 2008, 2009. Basically, the, the dairy sire testing goes away overnight, right? In the generation interval, particularly for these, these sires bulls and sires and cows, just, just Decline so quickly again because we don't need the progeny testing anymore with these bulls. Um, these genomic tests early on in life allow us to sort these animals um, and figure out who's going to be the young genomic sires we continue to use. Um, this uh, I might get uh, I might get tomatoes on that. This is from uh, Kelly Vitalik's presentation in World Congress from American Angus, but the same thing holds for for Simsmol, right? Um, we have this sort of pre two thousand and nine. Genetic progress, we have this post 2009 genetic progress. And in really um, standardizing our genetic, uh, our genetic estimates here, we're, we're making more genetic progress on the traits that we want to quicker because we have genomics. And, and this is this sort of ground truth, and, and this is only going to continue to grow as our, as our predictions get better. And my animations didn't shake out here what I wanted to, but uh, the idea um, that, that really all of this is built on is that we don't need. Um, but a few thousand markers in order to make these genomic predictions work, right? Uh, the, the issue, in, or I guess the, the opportunity that we have in populations like cattle is that DNA doesn't get inherited in one base at a time, right? And Allison talked about the three billion or so base pairs that cows get. It's not a random draw on every one of those base pairs. We have this process, again, of, of recombination. So during the during meiosis, when we're 
maybe you know, our germline cells are our eggs and our sperm. There's this process of the crossing over where you get your maternal, um, maternal chromosome, your maternal chromosome. They come up, they touch somewhere, they've got to do this. Um, and then a piece of DNA crosses over and you get this process of, of recombination. Uh, so other than that, these, these chunks of DNA are getting inherited um, in, in big, long stretches. And as a result, we don't need to observe every single one of these, um, every single spot on this DNA where there's a, a polymorphism or a SNP, right? We really just need to be able to account for these big chunks of DNA that are getting inherited together. The issue, though, is that as we go through time, right, um, this mutation maybe that we care about, um, the, the surrounding uh, genetic material that's, that's statistically linked with it is going to shrink as maybe a recombination event happens here, happens here, happens here, and over time, uh, the connection between this site and it, maybe its neighboring site that also has an effect on the trait that we care about, um, those start to shrink down, right? So, so this is how we built our, our genome prediction models, it's on the ability to capture most of the variation with the relatively small subset of markers, say 50,000 or so, on this paper from back in the US, so it would be far less than that in order to do this accurately. But um, anyways, this is sort of where we're at right now. We do a really good job um, with the tools we have, but I think there's some opportunities for us to improve this um, by, by adding in some knowledge of biology and doing a little bit more on the, on the genomic discovery side in, and I think that Simmental and IGS evaluation is really well positioned to take advantage of this. And so uh, I think that this is a paper from a couple years ago, which is known as selection and mature technology. Can we continue to improve this? And, and my answer is, is wholeheartedly yes. I think that there's a lot that we can continue to do. And the reason is that the genome is a really big place. Right? Um, Three billion base pairs. Uh, and I was thinking about double my number of, of polymorphisms across the genome. So these are maybe the ones that we're more confident in. But even then, this is a ton of genetic variation that we're able to preserve in these. Um, many of these SNPs are going to be very, very rare. You might only find them in a handful of individuals, but the odds that they have a, um, some sort of effect on these complex traits is, is, is relatively high. Um, again, 20,000 genes, all of these. Um, yeah, the genome is a big place. There's a lot of variation there. Can we do a better job of finding um, the, the SNPs, the functional, the variants that are actually causal for the traits that we care about, and, and leverage those in our genetic evaluations? And, and I think that we're in a position now to where we can start to exploit our existing genomic data and data that's being generated to, to really refine our, our search for markers and variants that they have a, I guess, play a big part in doing uh, more accurate genetic, genetic prediction. And so this is where, um, this is, I think, one of my only equations that I'll put in after the previous equation. Just to highlight one thing that I think is, is a really special opportunity for ASA to take advantage of. And that's that your, your genomic prediction model here, the super, um, super hybrid marker effects model, allows you um, to not just use those genetic um, markers to make a, a better relationship matrix between them. So right? it does that. But it also allows you to, to estimate these individual markers and the effects that they have on these traits. And so my, my impetus for, for pointing this out is what if we put the perfect markers in here, right? Um, I want to say there's, there's five or 6,000 markers, give or take, that, that get used um, to estimate these marker effects for current predictions. What if for every single trait we were able to identify the, the five or 6,000 markers that actually um, that had an effect on it, right? We're, we're no longer just relying on that marker to represent this big chunk of DNA um, that affects the trait, right? But what if we're putting the perfect markers in there? Can we observe um, some increases in the accuracy of our genome prediction? And very recently, there's been sort of an explosion of work in the, in the literature that says if we can identify markers that are, are functionally relevant, right, and do something for sure to biology in these animals, um, or these are causal variants. We're very sure that, that this mutation causes a, an X increase in, in trait Y. What if we plug those into our genetic prediction algorithms? And, and there's been a lot of success in, in leveraging um, this variant discovery, looking at all 30 million variants, finding the ones that have a higher impact on the traits that we care about, and integrating those into genetic, genetic predictions. 
uh, with some really promising results that I, I think as we, as we continue to move forward and think about this in the industry setting, there's a, a lot of opportunities for us to, to do some more of this. So uh, I guess my, the, the crux of what I'll talk about for the rest of the day is which variants you use are going to matter in this context, right? So there's got to be this level of discovery of variants that go into these predictions. Um, right now, obviously, the variants that are, are being used work very, very well. Um, but as we continue to move forward and we do some more biology and understanding how these complex traits work, um, picking these variants out matters, and, and how we integrate them into, into our, our genetic selection and genetic prediction algorithms really matters. And, and the, the real thing that I want to talk mostly about is this idea of using sequence density information. Our, our SNP chips are excellent tools, but there's, there's a lot of DNA variation in these things aren't capturing. And there's opportunities for us to, to use existing data some, from high coverage sequence animals, and we'll, we'll sort of walk through that in a second, to, um, to fill this gap and allow us to do some genetic discovery. Um, and, and this is stuff that we're, we're actively working on, right? Using Sinopol's data, um, adding some value to it from a, from a DNA sequence density perspective and in doing some biological discovery that we hope eventually um, feeds into an improved model for genetic creation. And so uh, what this all really comes down to is we start to talk about sequence, uh, sequence information and, and how that's different from SNP chips is it's a, a resolution question, right? Again, SNP chips are, are good enough um, for us to do a great job of genetic prediction, but as we start to try and discover What's going on underneath the surface of these things, right? We're trying to understand, you know, the 10,000 variants maybe that they control wheat, wheat, and cattle. Um, as we try and pinpoint the individual variants that have an effect on that, um, are we able to do that with the stitch of data? Um, probably not. Our resolution isn't quite good enough. But by, by adding some value, um, looking at full sequence data or imputation, which is what I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. We go from this sort of very granular view of the genome and, and how it relates to complex traits to this really, really high definition. Um, you know, the, my, my green TV that I'll be watching college football on, right? Um, you're able to get a, a much finer view of, of what's going on in the genome here on a, a less pixelated basis, maybe, than what a SIN chip is able to provide you. So, as we start to do this search for the variants that have a larger effect on the traits that we care about, um, this move towards having sequence uh, density data is really going to be the cornerstone of all that. And so this is a real example from Zimitol data on a trait. I, I forget which trait this actually is, but um, we call this a genome-wide association study. So basically what we're doing is the higher up one of these little dots, which is a, a SNP is, the more significantly associated it is with the, the trait that we care about. So, um, this it, on the top, this is the exact same data, uh, 120 or so thousand individuals in this, so a very, very highly powered analysis. And we're looking for SNPs that are associated with this particular trait. And so when we're just looking at, at the SNP 50 data and trying to find maybe that, that causal mutation or that perfectly linked SNP that's able to explain most of, or explain some, some high proportion of variance in that trait, uh, we, we see that up here. This is where it would say the best marker in this region is uh, to represent the trait that we care about. Whereas the perfect marker, or the causal mutation or whatever, might actually be over here, you know, a, a couple million base pairs away from, from where that, that other mutation is being identified with the, with the SNP chip is. So what this does again is a, a resolution thing. It's instead of watching it in, um, watching a TV show on, on your, your old um, sort of box TV. Um, this is our QLED top of the line resolution. We're really able to see all of those pixels and pick out what we want um, that we think matters the most for this given trait. And so uh, I guess the, the, the crux of that is, is we, we know that it's helpful to have this super high density information, but, but how, do we, how do we refine variants? How do we take our existing data and, and add this value to it through the process of imputation. 
uh, where does sequencing come in? How do you vary from prioritization? Um, all this stuff is, is sort of, uh, I don't want to get super scientific on, on any of this stuff, but there's, there's sort of a lot of ways and pathways that I've seen um, for us to, to leverage sequencing data and computation in this really granular, um, high definition genomic data to improve our, our prediction. And so the, the cornerstone of all this, and, and hopefully I, I can explain this in enough detail without getting too far in the weeds, is imputation. So uh, again, this, this 50K test that we do is, is excellent at helping us understand these big chunks of DNA that are inherited together. But there's a lot of missing spaces between our margins, right? So if there's, if there's you know, 40 million SNPs within the, the Sinemol population, we're probably accounting for, or we are accounting for such a small proportion of them. So in our example, we've got you know, a 50K um, sort of standard genome test. And over here, you'll see this is what our, our, our sort of imagined sequence data looks like. And what you'll see is that there's genotypes here across all of the consistent places where that SNP chip is, is genotyping. But there's a lot of missing data in this, right? There's a lot of spaces where the SNP chip isn't directly genotyping a, a known variant. And so when we go up here and we start searching for variants that are associated with our trait, um, we see that there's, uh, we're not necessarily maybe seeing that, that really possible or, or high impact marker rises to significance. But where imputation comes in is that we have lots of animals that we have more information on, right? We've, we've sequenced these animals at, at really, really high density or a really, really high coverage, we're very confident um, in all of those 30 to 40 million SNPs that we're able to call. And what we can do with imputation is take this data where we have lots of missing variants, we, we do this process of basing, so we figure out which haplotype um, does, this, does this chunk up here maybe represent, and we fill it in with the, with the known data from these really high coverage and, and high confidence individuals. And so what we're left with after that is for basically um, no additional cost, we're able to fill in um, a lot more information and maybe be able to discover a, a marker that has a big effect on a trait that wasn't initially represented on our, on our genomic test, right? So uh, again, this is maybe a, a more, at this point, academic exercise of taking this commercial data and making it into a format where we can do some sort of biological discovery. But the, at the end of the day, I, I hope that our biological discovery isn't just for the sake of human biological discovery. Uh, my hope is that we can use this eventually to help us identify um, variants that need to go on the next generation of chips, or um, as we'll sort of move on to in, in a couple slides here, as we move into a new generation of how we generate genotypic data, um, how do we leverage this sort of high density, um, millions and millions of markers in a, a genetic evaluation? And so, in order to do this, um, this imputation process is statistical, just like a just like an EPD calculation. And the more information we have to train these models, so what I mean by that are these reference set of haplotypes. So these are the animals that we have either sequence data or very high density genotype data on. The more of those animals and the more representative they are of our population, the more accurate this statistical estimate of these animals genotype. And so our goal here is to build the best reference panel possible. And this requires us to, to have representation, um, not just in a pretty specific context, but across breeds and across populations. The, the better this reference panel is, the better the imputation is at the end of the day, and the more accurate we can be um, when, we, when we introduce these, these variants that we discovered into a, into a genetic evaluation. And imputation, really, this is a real-life example that uh, we worked on where we look at how many errors we have when we're doing imputation in, in these individuals. Um, this was in Gelding, right? So if you think about Gelding, um, similar to Simtol in the fact that we've got an open bird book, right? So we've got representation across breeds here. Um, there's, there's Angus in there. There's, there's all sort of percentages of, of Gelding and Balancer um, that are, are in this data set. All we're looking at are, are those animals that are labeled Gelding. And again, similar, similar to what we would see when we look at this in the ball. But you'll see that when we look at each of these individual dots, which is a, an individual animal, and ask how many imputation errors are there, this is our, our way of quantifying how good of a job we're doing. You see that there's a lot of these animals that 
you know, pretty crappy job of, of computing. Well, they may be thousands of computation errors on these animals, whereas most of the animals are doing a pretty good job of it. And that tells me that there's adequate representation of the haplotypes, um, the chunks of DNA for these animals in our computation patterns. But what happens when we add this multi breed composite reference instead of just looking at a breed specific reference? Is that all of these animals that are up top that were poorly imputed initially, we do a whole lot better job of imputing them when we give them access to all of the genetic information um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this composite record. And so that was the, the motivation for us, and what we've been working on at, at UT with some of the Simpol folks is as we move towards using more of this data, um, doing more of this discovery, trying to add value uh, to the existing genotypes we all have generated. Um, how can we uh, how can we do better computation? And my answer there is we add more simple individuals to our computation pattern. So this is uh, we got some welfare support that we very much appreciate. It allowed us to, to go out there and our our genomic center at the University of Tennessee was able to, to match those funds and go out and we're sequencing somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 simple holes at very high level. And what this is going to allow us to do, and we're working on this right now. Um, I need to talk to Jack about getting the semen on about 10 more of these bulls that we haven't been able to find. Um, but we're, we're sequencing these animals actively, adding them into this existing imputation reference panel, and we'll be able to quantify the difference, the improvements that we see, not only in imputation accuracy, but in our, our ability to use these variants and discover um, high impact variants that are specific to the, the semen call population. Again, being more representative of this breed we care about in our, in our reference panel. And we really appreciate some people's help here. I think a, a model for other breeds, to, um, as, we're, as we're trying to leverage this, this data that's generated by the industry to do more discovery, um, imputation is really at the core of, of what we're doing and, and trying to maximize its accuracy is, is going to rely on, on sequencing more animals in this population. Our strategy has been pretty straightforward. Um, so we, we started out looking at the top 150 or 200 registered bulls based on registration. So um, if we're going to go out and compute this data in the population, we need these, these animals that we sequence to be really the most representative possible of the chunks of DNA that are floating around out there in the Senegal population. So we, we don't want to sequence animals that we already have sequence on, so we remove those. We remove animals whose sires are sequenced, uh, again, because that, that sire's DNA is already out there. Um, we don't want to don't double, double count that one, we'll maximize the value we get out of our, our individuals that we sequence here. Um, we cluster these remaining animals based on how genetically similar they are to each other, how <coughs> much DNA that they share, um, because that tells me if you're all within this cluster, there's a good chance that if we choose the, the most, um, most popular role, um, to have the most registered offspring in that cluster. Uh, that's going to help us keep the offspring in relationship by the related individuals of all the other animals in that very genetically related uh, cluster. And, and that's sort of our, our sequencing strategy in about 30 seconds. Um, and, and we're really excited about seeing what it does at the end of the day to how accurately we're able to achieve this data. And so the the beautiful thing here and what we're able to do in, in my lab is we take you know, 50,000 or 100,000 steps that are sort of the industry standards and for basically pennies of, of computational time, so we run all this on big computers at the university, um, we're able to add orders of magnitude more information. And so when we go and we try and hunt down these variants that control, you know, something like uh, heparin pregnancy or cow remaining being types, those are a couple of the things my lab is working on. Our ability to dial down on those really informative variants is, is so much better when we're looking at 30 million of them as opposed to the big chunks that are represented um, by those 50 thousand. <coughs> and so, what do we do with all this data, right? So, we have 30 million SNPs. Um, what does it matter? And again, this allows us to start digging into these trade associations. So, figuring out the, the variants that underlie these traits that we really care about. Um, not just the, the big chunk of DNA that's representative, um, but really dialing in on these perfectly associated variants with the trait um, and utilizing those in a, in a genetic prediction context. And also, lots and lots of work has been done with functionally um, trying to understand the, the genome of man, right? So, we, we know that there's lots of biology that happens under the hood of these traits, right? And, and so, with uh, some efforts that have happened across the international community, 
being able to, at a very fine level, identify SNPs um, that are going to be more likely to have a biological function. And, and there's been tons and tons of work that has shown that if we can identify these, we can annotate these, and we can choose these, we do a better job of, of doing genetic prediction in our population. And ultimately, what this, you know, in theory, would allow us to do is that if we know all of the hospitalizations, which again, that's that's really hard to do, um, but it's mean that if we can dial in more precisely on the variants that control these traits, we're no longer relying just on big chunks of, of DNA, um, but we're we're able to maybe do a better job of crossbreeding predictions. Um, again, something that's very important um, to the evaluation control on. Um, if we have a better idea of the the variants, um, the markers that underlie these traits and help us create them better. So uh, I guess just a, a quick um, word on a couple of the things that we're working on at, at UT in relation to this. Again, in sequencing some of these high index and involved sires, testing out what happens to our, our imputation process when we add these sires to them. Um, and then uh, a bunch of other work that we're doing with the derivative data, right? So we've got these 30 million SNPs. What questions are we asking them? So we're we're working on some of this variant prioritization. So identifying the high impact SNPs, maybe the functional ones, the ones that show up in these association studies, turning around and using them in a genomic prediction. Uh, how does that change uh, our accuracy in doing that? And we're looking for some growth in performance rates. Also, have grad students working on fertility and some cow breeding phenotypes, um, trying to understand. Uh, are there are there sort of genetic controls over a cow's ancestors period geared back up in cycles quicker? And do really the genetics that underlie that uh, that very complicated play. So the, the last thing I'll mention in regards to sequencing is related but a little bit different. And it's this idea that sequencing is continuing to get cheaper. Um, this is Moore's law is is sort of the idea that every how many years the cost of a computer chip gets half as expensive, right? And so what we've seen is that, yeah, computer chips have gotten uh, a lot more expensive um, until like, 2021, where they sort of shot back up to you know, kind of all the other stuff that's happened this year. But the idea is that, that the cost per sequencing of genome, this is in humans, but the, the same goes for cattle, it's really outpaced Moore's law, right? We're, we're able to sequence genomes now for less than $1,000, Really incredible considering the human genome project um, cost a couple billion dollars um, to do one of those things back in 1997. And so sequencing is getting a whole lot cheaper. How are we able to leverage sequencing to do some of the more routine pieces of, of genetic evaluation and generating genotypes that go into our evaluations? That's where this idea of low pass sequencing coupled with imputation, and this might be something that you've heard a bit about, um, it, it allows us to, to take very low coverage genomes, which I'll explain in a second, use the same sort of imputation idea um, in order to generate genotypes fairly inexpensive. And there's a, a product, and JR and I will talk about this later, in the, the panel that Eugene is offering in conjunction with uh, a company called Genco. It's called Infinity. And this is sort of the commercial application of low pass sequencing and imputation. And I, I think this is really going to change how we generate genomic data in our, our population moving forward. And so the, the difference between this idea of low pass sequencing and chip based is that with chips, what we do is we, we've gone and done this discovery phase and we figured out um, 50,000, 100,000 markers. Um, there are fixed places in the genome. We designed these little things called, I say we, but um, the, the folks at the engine and, and elsewhere. Um, Designing these probes that fit to this specific point in the DNA, very similar to what Allison was talking about, our uh, the CRISPR mechanism or all these gene editing. Um, they go and they find this place in the genome where we know um, this little probe sequence fits. And then we know that right on the other side of that probe sequence is a, a single nucleotide type one marker, a SNP. And depending on which one is there, um, you're either going to get a green or a red um, fluorescent nucleotide that comes in. Um, and that's what allows us to measure the intensity of colors here, and that allows us to know um, whether you're a, an AT, an AA, a TT, whatever the, the genotype is at that particular position. But what happens when we do sequencing is that it's more of a, it's more of a random shotgun approach, right? We have these little things called, called reads, and the 
is is that about 150 or 200 base pairs long. And what we do is we, we read across all the DNA, we blast it up in chunks, we do all these little reads randomly across, and what we're able to do is stack these reads on top of each other, align them um, again to this reference genome, uh, which is the, something else that Allison mentioned earlier. And what we're able to do is based on how confident we are, um, we maybe see a polymorphism pops up here in all of these reads. Uh, we call that relative to the reference genome all across, um, all across the genome. And so our, our confidence and our ability to call these places, these genetic differences, is dependent on how many reads we do over a given position. And so we'll talk a lot about coverage in the context of sequencing. The higher our coverage is, the more times on average that we read a particular point in the genome, the more confident we are in calling a, a SNP that we say. But what low pass sequencing does is instead of doing this, you know, typically when we sequence animals at high coverage, we're getting an average of 10 or 15 reads or 20 reads um, on, across the genome on average. Whereas with low pass sequencing, we're only getting somewhere in the neighborhood of, of half, um, half X. Um, so, you know, only half of the, uh, or I guess on average, half of the places in the genome get at least one read over them, um, all the way up to, to a one X. So, uh, again, you're going to have points in the genome that are, are overrepresented. You might have three or four reads um, that overlap this one place, um, but a lot of the genome just isn't going to get covered at all. And so, where imputation comes in is we can use this just like the if We make our higher confidence calls where we've got those um, more sequencing reads that have gone over, but um, we're also able to fill in these places where we're not confident at all what this animal is um, using the same sort of imputation. And the, the long and short of low fast sequencing plus amputation is that when you look at how well it relates to the genotypes that show up on these SNP arrays, uh, they're very, very, um, they're, they're very, very close to each other, right? So, again, depending on the breed, somewhere between you know, 99 plus percent of the places um, that we do uh, imputation on low pass data, we have the exact same genotype that we do if we were looking at the and what this means is that I, I think that as we continue to see the cost of, of, of sequencing continue to decline, this is going to allow us to, to use this maybe as a cheaper alternative in the future. Um, again, not right away, but uh, projecting out in the future, a cheaper opportunity to, to create this genotyping data. And again, instead of having 50,000 SNPs, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 million of these SNPs that we're able to analyze and we do this slow pass sequencing. And inflation process. And I think I've got just a couple more minutes here, and I, I want to touch really briefly um, on the idea of, of how do we do a better job of measuring phenotypes? Um, because at, at the end of the day, this is what our genetic evaluations have been and continue to be built upon is our ability to reliably measure phenotypes um, on big contemporary years. And this is a quote that I always come back to. I can get lost in the weeds sometimes with, with this genomic stuff imputation and sequencing, but at the end of the day, when it comes to predicting the genetic merit of animals, in the age of genotype, phenotype is king. Uh, my coffee, a uh, guy that I know well from Scotland, um, always says this, phenotype is king, phenotype is king. And, and I think that we're in this era where generating more informative phenotypes is, is going to be possible using some emerging technology. And I, I always talk about this in the context of a phenotype and paradox, right? Where there's this sort of universal relationship um, between the difficulty or expensiveness of measuring a phenotype and the number of phenotypes that we're willing to measure, right? The barriers to entry measuring a birth weight are pretty low, right? You've got a, a hand scale or a tape, uh, or, or maybe you're just a really good guess, but I know there's probably a few of those um, in the audience. But, but again, lots of birth weights in our energetic evaluation. Uh, we point barriers to entry are a little bit higher, right? Um, we've got to have a scale to do this. But then as we get into these things that are really, really central to the breeding goals of, of Simtol and all the other bee breeds, things like carcass traits, we have way, way less of those. And again, the majority of all of these animals through the, through the value chain um, sort of shrinks down um, from, uh, from these initial ones that are happening on all of our farms. Then we get into feed efficiency. There's this upfront cost measuring a feed efficiency phenotype. And stuff that we're, we're sort of moving into in the academic research here, um, this idea of, of greenhouse gas emissions, um, whether they're actually the, uh, 
Um, as big of a problem as they, they claim that they are, I'm not quite sure. Um, but again, being able to feed attack these things is really hard for them to use our, um, our methane measurement device at the University of Tennessee delivered last week and it was all of $101,000. So again, um, these are expensive phenotypes, which means that if we want to do a genetic evaluation on them, um, we need to create a lot of them that are expensive to do so. And then we move into these things that are just really hard to measure, right? Disease risk, how do we quantify that? How do we uh, develop a genetic prediction for that? Or things like environmental stress tolerance, how do we identify animals uh, that are robustly able to handle uh, the environment that they're from? And so when I sort of take a step back, and I'm interested in feedback from other folks here, um, what phenotypes do we need? Where, where are the gaps in what we're able to measure and predict in our genetic evaluation? And the thing that I always come back to is fertility is a really tough nut to crack, right? Our measures for fertility, um, whether they're you know, hyper pregnancy, the binary phenotype, I know Lane has been cranking really hard on that. Um, but, but again, these, these measures from Holford reporting are better than some of the other stuff we've got. Uh, but again, when we dial into the biology of fertility a little bit closer, measure things that are maybe more directly uh, getting impact whether or not that animal is pregnant as a heifer or as a cow whatever. Uh, I think those are, there's a lot of work we can do in some technologies that will allow us to do that. The one that I'm particularly interested in in the route of the research program is headed down is understanding pasture-based efficiency. Uh, we don't have a great way of measuring feed intake on pasture, uh, but if we had that sort of information, we can predict how efficient the cow is. Uh, that's a big win for us in the industry. So uh, finding feed intake tools that allow us to um, either directly or indirectly measure the intake on pasture is really, really important. Disease health and use function, I think, is a constant moving target, um, but something that if we can get a handle on, we can add a ton of value um, through genetics uh, on, on the health front. Environmental adaptability, uh, my PhD is really focused on that, something that we're still very interested in is, is how do we use phenotyping to match animals to the environment will they will express their genetic potential um, to the, the best of their ability. And then this idea of greenhouse gas emission, right? Um, I think that we're, we're approaching this point in time, like it or not, where we have to be conscientious of this, and it's something that's being picked up in our reading objectives. So having the ability to measure the types of things like these uh, are going to be really important for us to not only demonstrate that we're a really sustainable industry, but that we can improve on our already small environment. And so some of the things that we're, we're piloting out right now, um, we've got, we're piloting these, these are called cow manager tags. Um, they're, they're originally developed for dairy operations. Um, doing these in a beef operation we've got at one of our research farms is substantially harder because we've got cows um, that like these sort of straight lines for these radio frequency things to um, make contact with the router and there's not a whole lot of straight lines um, in, in Middle Tennessee, as you go up and down hills and, and through timbers and forest drive. Right? But again, something that we're, we're starting to play around with and understanding can we, you know, if the cost of these things goes down and up, can we use these to directly measure estrus? Is that maybe a, a closer biology, fertility, phenotype for us? Um, understanding when cows are cycling, when cows are getting bred um, in a, a little bit more granular way. Um, heat stress, can we see um, the relative temperature change in these animals? based on the, the thermometer that's, that's inside these. Um, can we use this to detect subclinical disease and use that to be type down the line, right? So I think there's potential in these sensors, but at the moment they're being pretty expensive. Um, and, and how we take this data, aggregate it all, and turn it into a, a single phenotype that fits well into a genetic evaluation, I think there's tons of questions about that as well. Um, again, I, I sort of covered this pasture-based intake thing, but I think this question is really interesting. Because we have the intake in these, right? Um, measure on a, on a grow safe on a, uh, on a C log system, right? We're able to gather the intake data. But I think there's also, beyond that ability to turn energy um, into weight or melt or, or thermoregulate or whatever if you're a cow, uh, I think that there's also a behavioral component to this, um, the way that some cows are able to go out and, and graze their drinking behaviors. And then there's also an environmental layer on this that becomes really hard to. Uh, hard to get a handle on, right? So our variation you can see in forage, seasonality, the, the stressors that these animals are under. Um, I think being able to measure these in aggregate is going to open up some uh, a pathway forward to doing some predictions 
on, on hazard-based meat intake and how efficient our cattle are. Um, this is our, our, our Cadillac system for measuring greenhouse gas efficiency. Um, it doesn't look like it costs one hundred twenty thousand dollars, but but it, it definitely does. But anyways, I think there's also some potential here uh, again measuring these sort of directly. Uh, how much is this cow in? Um, does this eventually end up in a selection index, or are we going to weight the greenhouse gas emissions of our cows? Or can we use this to demonstrate the, the sustainability of our industry already? Right? Um, can we use this to get carbon credits and say, hey man, my cows are really really efficient, and the government needs to needs to compensate me for that to offset, you know. British Petroleum or Shell's market credit, right? So, so again, yeah, I think there's opportunities here to measure these green types as we uh, as we continue to make them cheaper and easier to measure. Um, and, and sort of the, the last thing I'll mention is this idea of molecular intermediate green types. Uh, Allison had a similar slide up on her on her slideshow, and this is something that we're pursuing. And, and all of these things that are really hard to directly measure um, at the individual animal level. Can we take a step back and we've been working on some methods for easily and cheaply measuring something like um, the gene expression in, in an animal or the abundance of proteins or metabolites? Can we use this information to sort of construct uh, proxy phenotypes um, in place of going out and measuring something that's really, uh, really hard to get out of really expensive to measure? And, and so, uh, again, a couple of the things that we're, we're working on actively uh, at the University of Tennessee. Um, cow efficiency on forage is the, is the big one. We're really interested in pursuing that, and, and we would, would love to talk about some partnerships um, with, with operations in the future, and this part of the world particularly, um, that are very interested in understanding that a little bit better. Um, precision livestock farming is really big at UT. We've made a bunch of investments, um, and I'm, I'm convincing these people to do more animal management. That we need to think about how we can use all this data that's getting generated as a, as a phenotype at the end of the day. And, and then eventually we're working towards you know, the mechanistic models that allow us to predict the individual performance of animals across environments. And I, I think that's the big ticket. Understanding how we match animals, um, the optimal production scenario, uh, understanding that this bull in Montana maybe isn't a great fit in Tennessee, and figuring out the, the best way for us to do that is, is something. And I think there's lots of big questions. I won't walk through all these because I think I'm not right up on my time for the presentation. But I think there's going to be a lot of work between our, our academic groups that are doing some of the more nitty gritty, uh, whether it's very discovery or piloting some of these methodologies, uh, working directly with breed associations to see what's practical, uh, what are we actually able to implement in, in real life. And, and so I think there's going to be tons of opportunities for us to continue collaborating on this stuff. And so with that, um, I'll leave you with a couple of my takeaways here, my contact information, and you know, I really thank you guys for letting me come here and talk a little bit about the, the stuff that gets my juices flowing. Uh, I think it's a super exciting time to be in the genetic evaluation business and the animal genomic space, um, and I think it's a really exciting time to be a, um, a seed stock producer, um, understanding a lot of the technological developments that are coming down the pipe. That it'll allow us to, to all do our job better. So, with that, I'll, I'll answer some questions and again, appreciate you guys having me. Questions for Dr. Rowan? Can you give me one second? Um, okay. Mike's done. Up in Canada, they're doing some studies on the pasture cattle efficiency at the same. Do you guys know about that? Do you coordinate any uh, other places in different environments? No, that's a that's a really good um, really good point. I haven't not aware of the work um, in Canada or who's leading those efforts. I would certainly be interested because I think that's a big piece of the cattle efficiency thing. Um, an active proposal we're working on is even just looking at um, populations in Tennessee and some of those out of U.S. Mark, right? Two very, very different environments and, and animals that are able to be efficient in one aren't necessarily efficient in the other. So I think you're absolutely right. Any work on the, on the cattle efficiency standpoint is, is going to be multi environmental, um, uh, looking at, at this multiple, multiple environments. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, thank you for the talk, and I appreciate your enthusiasm for actually being something as a you know, biomechanics uh, engineer. So, yeah. um, so I, have, I have actually two questions I'd like to go to. The first is um, Is there any advantage, or has anybody been utilizing long read technology like Manafort? Because um, with the long read, you can capture you know, the structural variance, transportation, conversion from all our Standpoint. So you asked a question earlier, is there effort to complete the caption, right? There was a big, uh, they call it telomere to telomere. So from one end of the chromosome to the other, um, for humans, it was what was finally mentioned is your no gaps. Um, and, and yeah, there's an active telomere to telomere um, group in, in the cattle genomics community. In addition to the pan genomes, so they're trying to represent all of the diversity that exists within cattle. Um, it's, it's sort of the, that T and T assembly is going to be the, the backbone of that assembly is fine. Is I guess there, and, and of course they're using long range technology, the pack bottom to do that. But one of the really interesting, uh, you mentioned nanopore, which I don't know if anybody has seen these things. They're like the size, I don't know, they're like about the size of this clicker, um, but they're sort of real time. You plug them in your computer, you drop DNA onto it, and you can actually sequence animals on a machine that is this big. They cost a few thousand dollars. And some really interesting applications of those are, are doing on-site genotyping in Australia. So when you've got these absolutely enormous stations, cattle running on you know tens of thousands of acres, um, you get that animal off at one time and you're not going to wait um, to bring them back in to do selection once the results for their genomic test are back. So in some cases, they're using these, these little nanopore technologies to generate uh, genotypes on site and in real time sort of run that genomic prediction before that animal even needs to leave the pen, which I think is a pretty wild and out there application that um, uniquely needed in, in Northern Australia. And then uh, my second question is really about uh, data, like data warehousing for the data. Um, yeah, are there public repositories that have associated phenotypic or high confidence phenotypic data um, for the bovine like, sequencing projects? Is that a public resource or are those private um, data from the data sources? Yeah, so that's a good, uh, another good question is who, who owns all this data? Um, if we, we generate sequence data and we want to use it to be competitively advantaged academically, um, you know, we we'll hold on to that. We're very, my lab is very open eyed, so what we, what we generate, particularly if it's, if it's, uh, if it's federally funded, um, it's going to go out into the, into the greater world, right? I think that um, this idea of there needs to, needing to be in the club to have access to this data that can really uh, elevate their sciences um, is really holding us back in the, in the big picture. So we're, we're sharing this data. Um, the NIH has a big sequence data repository that, that all of this data goes into. Um, it's, it's accessible by folks, but um, how much phenotypic data gets tied to those is, uh, is sort of variable. Is it an SRA? Or yeah, SRA. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, I have a simple question. Yeah, because that's too deep for me, Troy. Um, you talk a lot about green efficiency and your interest for your pasture efficiency and different sorts of efficiencies. Right. And, and, and the word efficiency is banded around a lot. Right. Some of it's marketing based, even occasionally it has something to do with some facts. Um, are those of us who are making selection and breeding decisions? How do you encourage folks to look at these things? Should they be looking at individual predictions? Or is there still a better platform to kind of run all this stuff through when we're making decisions via an index or something like that? So, so your question is, is if we're trying to select for cow efficiency, how do we do it? Now, like now. Now we need more and more like going forward. Yeah, no, I think that um, Jim and I talked about selection indexes um, quite a bit. And I, I think that that's ultimately where where that would be most practical, right? 
um, understanding that it's going to be a bunch of traits that work in concert with one another. There's going to be genetic correlations that exist there, um, whether it's, you know, you know, milk is going to factor into this. Um, a cow's actual, can we measure a cow's actual um, resting metabolic um, potential drive? So I think that putting all these things together in a, in a single index eventually, um, whether it's, you know, uh, a cow efficiency index, right, um, or whether it's whatever that looks like, or maybe even in the context of different environments, right? Is there, is there an index that we can design um, that, that maybe? To, to help again match these cattle to more stressful production environments. So I think that anytime you've got something like that, uh, the index is, is always the way to um, make all that stuff, um, make all that work. So yeah, I'm sure I'd like to start off by commending you for an excellent presentation. Um, I have never heard you give a presentation before. We've talked about it a long time. A uh, few beers together. Um, I even leaned over to Jack and said, Troy's a good explainer. Excellent job explaining. Anyway, I think that you've taken complex topics and I think you've, you've uh, delivered them down. And, uh, and not necessarily delivered them down, you put them in the language that we cowboys can understand. Um, so I'm particularly curious, I'm kind of closing the chips question to some degree. So the bottom right hand um, box there is an area I'm curious about. Uh, is that something you have on the drawing board or have you been moving and making any progress? Because I think that's an area that we're woefully behind. And, uh, and really the only way we're going to get at from a practical standpoint, when you're talking about cheap body interaction, you've got to have a lower level of aggregation simulation modeling. And at this point, I mean, there's been efforts many, many years ago, um, decades ago, that I think were very, um, they were very, uh, I wouldn't say fruitful because they pretty much were terminated. What I'm curious about is where you're at with that, and I suspect it's on the drawing board. I'm not very much further than that, but I'm curious if you could give us shed more light on what your intent intent is. Yeah, I, I had like 15 more slides on the buddy. That's why it's on my conclusion slide, but not in the presentation. But um, you're, you're right; it's very much on the drawing board. But we're we're moving on some of this. Um, in particular, the the way that I, I guess we were addressing it with Simon Paul Day during my PhD would drive me, and I can use this slide that we've got here, um, or it can be handy. Um, so, so the way that we initially are, were thinking about this QIE question, right, is we split the US up into these chromatic zones, right? So we've got these temperature presets and elevation. We divide the US into these discrete zones here, either, you know, in the northeast or up in the west, but that we develop southeast and so on and so forth. Um, is it possible to um, do some very discovery there? Um, is this where we go? Right? We have an animal who's maybe, um, there's this idea of rebranding between environments is something that I guess uh, when we were rethinking about, right? That this animal is, is averaging the you when know, we look across the country is, is 35. Um, he's maybe a terrible fit down here in the southeast in Vestman Belt, whereas he, he ends up being a much better fit up here in the, the high plains or what we call the forest mountains, right? So I think that that's sort of one approach that, you know, in theory there's, there's maybe, that's maybe a solution, but the issue there becomes you're all of a sudden running, you know, nine genetic evaluations, and even then there's a, this idea of of management. I know in the state of Tennessee, I've done a lot of operations where the, the management differences from you know, the operation on this side of the fence to the operation on this side of the fence are bigger than the environmental differences um, between these climatic regions. So I think that the models that we'll come up with eventually, and I've, I've been talking, I have a friend who is actually a plant geneticist, and, and plants have this cool thing they call crop growth models, which 
basically uh, they take these, these component input traits that they're able to measure, as well as environmental data, and because they understand the physiology of plants so well, um, they're able to, to develop these models that allow you, um, with a given environmental input, a given management input, right? You get how much fertilizer you get, um, what's the, the growing season like where you're at, that can give you a, a, a relatively high accuracy guess at the phenotype of that animal, right? So it allows you to understand G by E in a little bit more mechanistic way. The issue with that in general is that we don't have as good of an understanding of the physiology of, of growth traits, of the fertility of all these things. And we also can't plant the exact, we can't clone cows um, and grow them in, in every single environment like we can plant. So um, he and I have, have been kicking around ideas about how we might do something like that. And, and I think that, um, again, because we work with you guys so much to the all the data, um, and because we can buy it to a location, is a, a logical um, sort of way to do that. So again, very much on the drawing board, but um, uh, it's going to be a tough not to crack the G by E thing, but I think it's it's really important um, in, in how we do production and being able to match you with the home farm. I think that's very noble. Overall, I've got a guy you probably need to talk to, you don't probably know who he is, his name's Rick Ford. Who's that? Rick Ford. Okay. He's a long, he's older than me. Uh, so, <laughs> he would, uh, I think it would be very beneficial. That's an interaction with him. Yeah. Uh, Joy, thanks for your presentation. I think older than way, that, that's pretty old. Yeah. Um, and also, thanks for putting me down these Colorado in the desert. And that's probably pretty accurate. Um, from a person that's really dived into the feed efficiency uh, real hard in our program, is there a study been done? Has anybody looked at the, we talked about the cow efficiency versus the feed efficiency with the units? Is there any correlation that can be done as they're done as yearling, especially females, to mature cows? Is that in the is that coming? Is, is anybody looking at that? Is that is there any correlation yet to how they perform in the facilities to how they perform on as mature cows? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And, and I think uh, I literally just got done writing a review paper about this this idea of how do we measure cow efficiency. And a lot of these pieces have been put together right, so we know that your feed efficiency is a is a heifer right on the unit. Um, whether you're being fed concentrate or, um, or a forage based diet on, say, a feed efficiency testing unit, those are, are fairly highly, but not perfectly correlated. Um, the issue that arises, I think, is that even if you're feeding mature cows um, in a, a grow safe with you know, whatever quality forage, I think that there's still a level of of behavior and physiology that you just don't capture um, between a uh, grazing cow and a cow on the lot who's getting deep delivered to it, right? So uh, the way I think about this too is, is it's kind of from this, this G by E and environmental fit position. Uh, a cow might be low intake on grass as a mature cow because she hasn't shed her winter coat and she's hanging out under a tree all day instead of grazing, right? So again, it's, uh, I think that trying to uh, my goal is to figure out ways that we can focus in on each like, of these component traits and bring them together, right? How well is a cow able to metabolize energy at, at all, right? Whether that's you know something that we can capture on, say, a gross state, but also the, the behavioral component, the adaptability component um, that also goes into that feeding state and efficiency ultimately out on the grass. I don't, I don't know if that exactly answers your question or not, but I think there's still some missing pieces in how we're able to truly measure forage-based feed intake. Um, because the, the units are our, our best tools for that now. And aside from going out, and, you know, there's some ways to do uh, sort of tracer experiments where you're, you're able to go out and, and measure it on very low numbers of animals in the field, but it's a, it's a real challenge. So again, something more to work on. Is there any way to tie in mature cow weight um, 
body condition score, you're talking the penal type collection with the way that young female as an ever performed in the units. We gotta get to that point, especially in our desert country. We gotta find where where that female that performed really well on a forage based diet in the units yep. is she correlating that as a mature cow on on grass that's where i think in a hard part of the country it's done it'll be huge it'll be a big huge yeah uh, the, uh, dave walmart's group with oklahoma state has done um, some pretty small some smaller scale work on this um just trying to bring down those units and correlation more time between uh cows what happens when you're feeding a heifer, lowish quality forage, um, and then again when she's a mature cow? And those things are fairly correlated, but I, I totally agree. Um, but understanding how she carries her condition, what her mature size is, I'm not sure if we've got far enough on, on being able to do actual genetic correlations on that. So something to, something to keep in mind, and I guess motivation in collecting these inside of our, our females. Um, and eventually we'll get to a point where that's a Okay, any final burning questions? All right, let's thank our speaker.